Detroit Business Hub Group Director Nancy O'Neill works with her team of experts. Listen to conversations with business professionals to discover the latest business innovations, insights, and trends. Find out what's hot and what's not in today's business market. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening for our late edition of Detroit Business Hub Group. I won't be before you long. I just wanted to introduce our speaker for Thursday. Her name is Attorney Tanya Phillips. She was on our show about three weeks ago, and she's going to be back with us again on Thursday to discuss the renter's moratorium. So I'm going to go ahead and get started with our membership video, and then we're going to watch a little bit of her video that she did with us about three weeks ago. Here we go. Hi, I'm Nancy O'Neill, the director of the Detroit Business Hub Group. We were recently featured in Fortune and Entrepreneur Magazine. I started DBHG to help real estate and insurance agents compete in today's competitive marketplace. As a former real estate and insurance agent, I did not have a mentor myself who I was accountable to. As a member of DBHG, we network, mentor, and train sales professionals to be competitive in today's marketplace. Our certification and accreditation helps you to level up. One of the big reasons we became part of this was to be around other people that are involved with the same kind of business we're in, which is real estate. And we don't want people to go through some of the things you went through as far as trying to find financing. Uh, we're trying to tip give those resources to people so they know where to go to get that information and get those lenders and contact information. It's not just finance, but also, um, like you said, mentorship involved in, I mean, anything from finding your appraiser to finding your commercial real estate agent. I believe with the mentorship program, you can really catapult yourself into a long-term successful career as an insurance agent or real estate agent. As a DBHG member, you receive access to experienced business coaches in your industry and coaching sessions, access to capital, access to DBHG mastermind coaching sessions, access to DBHG podcasts, access to webinars, in-person seminars and workshops, access to our DBHG certification and accreditation programs, and networking opportunities with like-minded professionals in your industry. There are a lot of things that we learned along the way and it's, it was a great tool for us to come here and I think it's beneficial for the people here that don't know about how to uh, go about purchasing and all the resources that are out there to get that information from someone like me that can uh, make, make their journey easier for them that they don't have to reinvent the wheel. When I was in real estate, I actually signed up for a mentorship program. Um, there's a very charismatic salesperson um, who got me started with the mentorship program. I found out that my mentor was not even a former real estate agent or had experience in real estate um, and really didn't get a whole lot out of the experience. So my advice to new business owners is that um, to make your startup costs count. Uh, startup costs can be very expensive and this is a tangible investment that you can make into your business that's going to help your business grow. Yes, I'm working with DBHG. Uh, we have an event coming up January 22nd and we are launching an investment club and I'm excited about it. I just want to give everybody an opportunity to be able to build wealth and leave a legacy to their uh, family as well. So this will be the, like uh, with the opportunities that I have in front of me, that it'll be profitable, uh, we'll do very well, and everybody will be happy. I'm gonna be telling my story, some of my strategies, and, and things that I did to build my real estate portfolio, and then also launching uh, the Real Estate Investment Club. A lot of professional networking uh, from a real estate perspective. You know, today we have a commercial seminar very informative, met a lot of different professional people in real estate, uh, investment, uh, a lot of investment consultants. So it's overall, in my last year, it's been a very positive networking experience. Networking is the, the lifeline, I mean the blood of it. This is a relationship-based business. That's the bottom line. You're only good as your name and people is what they view you as, so. Oh, networking is very important. Uh, relationships are always key with anything that you do, you find out that the recommendations of some people that a lot of the banks use the same people. 
Um, a lot of uh, the real estate uh, uh, agents go to the same people and because they know their work and they trust that they're going to be honest with their evaluations of different things. So Where like-minded people come together for one common goal and we are heavily I mean, focused on community service and that's where really the organization is really, really roots and what we're rooted on is actually helping the community. And that's one of the big things of us getting involved with commercial development is to try to redevelop our communities. That's what this whole thing is really all about. Minority business owners today need mentorship, training, and networking opportunities. We provide that with DBHG. Okay, well hopefully you enjoyed our membership video. Hopefully you are interested in becoming a member of DBHG. For more information, feel free to visit our website at dbhg.org. Next, we're going to take a look at our speaker. Uh, this is her last podcast with us. We're going to review that again. So you can join us on Thursday for a continuation of our conversation regarding the National Renters Moratorium expiring. Of course, we know it has been extended until October, but this discussion needs to continue because we definitely don't want to see our sisters and brothers without a place to live. So um, hopefully Tanya with her vast amount of experience is going to give us some advice on um, places that we can go to get help. So let's go ahead and get started with our last podcast. So you can definitely join us on Thursday and tell your friends to join us at 6 p.m. on Thursday for our next live podcast with attorney Tanya Phillips. Here we go owners and mm -hmm. um, tenants. So please share your background with us and um, so we can get to know you a little bit better. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Well, I was born and raised in the city of Detroit. I still live in the city and I've dedicated my career to addressing issues and concerns of equitable development, racial equality, social justice. I just look for where I can make a difference in the quality of people's lives and how the law can help with that, essentially. So right. over the years, um, as Nancy mentioned, we work together at the Sugar Law Center for Economic and Social Justice. And that is a specialty law firm that focuses on workers' rights, civil rights, um, our economic development portfolio work has grown a bit um, mm -hmm. in the last 20 years. So I work on those type of issues for the law firm. And I also serve as a public policy advisor for Michigan Legal Services. And that is one of the oldest legal services agencies in the state of Michigan, not just the city of Detroit. And I just look at policies that um, our, help us have a bet, better housing policies for all in the city of Detroit, in the state of Michigan, essentially. And um, I'll be glad to share about one of the events that I'm, I'm working on and, and why we think why it's important. So that's a little, little snapshot about me. <laughs> Nancy mentioned I, I have a husband, a 13-year-old son, just graduated from the eighth grade. So I'm preparing oh, for high school. <laughs> Like I said, we're yeah. aging each other because mm -hmm. I remember when he was born. So mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we feel old. Yeah. Oh wow. Well, time is fine. Where did your son go to school? Oh, I, I don't want to put that on live. <laughs> oh, okay, because too personal TMI. Okay, I understand. Yeah. yeah. But I'll tell you off now. <laughs> oh, okay. One mm -hmm. off. Okay, no problem. Well, I yeah. am happy that um, he graduated from eighth grade. That is so exciting. Mm -hmm. And um, so you have this event, even though I know this is not the type of law that you're normally in, you have this event coming up soon. I'm trying to pull up the, um, the flyer now. Mm -hmm. But um, tell us about the event on June 29th. Sure. Well, the event is Detroit Right to Counsel. And basically what we're talking about is the importance of having legal representation when you're going to court and facing eviction. Um, right to Counsel is a growing um, kind of movement throughout the country. And, you know, just like if you were arrested for a crime and you couldn't afford to pay an attorney, you would have you have a right to an attorney because okay. the, the values behind the law. Uh, say that the risk of liberty, loss of your liberty and freedom is such a, a 
a high risk and an important value in our society that you shouldn't go into court unrepresented, not knowing what you're talking about, right? So right to counsel, we have that on the criminal side, but there's not an equivalent version of that on the civil side. So you often have individuals going to court um, in a position where they may lose their home, they may lose their parent custodial rights, they may lose guardianship. You know, there's a lot to lose on the civil side as well. So the right to counsel movement in a broader sense is looking at how we can provide legal representation for low to moderate income individuals. And our event on the 29th is focused on three things. One, how we can implement such an initiative here in Detroit where so many people are um, housing insecure, right? Uh, Providing legal counsel and advice to low to moderate income tenants. We also have an eviction moratorium, federal moratorium that's been in place for a while now, but it is set to expire on June 30th. Oh, no. Is that COVID or other factors? Well, um, it seems that since the um, CDC has loosened up their restrictions, the moratorium was based on um, health concerns and staying in place orders and things of that nature. So it looks like CDC um, is lessening the, the state of emergency or saying we're not in a state of emergency. You know, I guess people decide what, what they feel about that. But in any case, you know, that moratorium was from the CDC. It is set to expire on June 30th unless there's some extension. But if there's not, then people need to be aware of that and they need to know what to do and who to call. (laughs) So we're going to talk about that as well. Hmm? Is that why you're having your event on June 29th? Yes, to let people know about the moratorium expiring, let people know where they can get assistance, and to talk about this larger um, societal issue of legal representation for low to moderate income people. Because truth be told, you know, Detroit was in a housing crisis before the pandemic. The pandemic just put a lot of uh, these social problems on display and aggravated them, escalated them. But evictions were a problem before then. They still will be a problem afterwards unless we come together as a community to do something about it. So right to counsel is one tool, I believe, in a toolbox of really stabilizing housing in our community. So that's what we're talking about. We'll have um, experts um, in the city of Detroit. We'll have people talk about what's going on at the 36th District Court. We're going to look at how um, the housing crisis affects black women in particular Mm -hmm. in Detroit. Mm -hmm. Um, Also our undocumented communities, their stories are often not told. We're going to look at mental health angles. We're going to hear data and statistics that's being connected on this issue. Because some people may think, "Hmm, you know, I'm not at risk of eviction. This isn't really for me. But it's really in all of our best interest to have safe, stable, affordable housing for all. It really benefits everyone in terms of um, the larger social and economic picture. A prosperous city, a more prosperous city is good for all of us. And we talk about connecting those dots. Um, We have people from other cities to show how it's worked out for them. And it, we're going to have a nice, nice uh, time. So join in on June yeah. 29th, starting at 6 p.m. And to get more information about that, you can go to Facebook. We have our Facebook page. And that is Facebook.com, Detroit RTC. Facebook.com, Detroit RTC. So log on, like that page. Register for the event. If you don't want to register, we want you to register so we can keep in touch and send you reminders. <laughs> but if you don't, then it will be streamed live on Facebook as well. And um, you know, this is a new concept for Detroit, mm-hmm. but it's it's one that you know makes moral sense and business sense. So please, please log in and support. Okay, what does RTC stand for? Right to Council. Oh, you did say that earlier. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm putting it in the comments section so everyone um, is aware of the website as well. So they can look there if mm-hmm. they see it, just in case they see the replay. Okay. 
Um, so Tanya, um, also share with us, how did you actually get interested in public policy in this type of law? Mm, you know, well, it really started when I was um, a child, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't have anyone around me immediately that was a lawyer. Mm -hmm. But somehow, you know, I had this notion <laughs> in my heart, <laughs> you know, and I, I believe it was divine. I just really had um, a sense that law was able to impact our society. And I, I was interested in it. I wanted to have a piece of it. I looked around at conditions in my neighborhood and I, you know, I thought they, things didn't have to be as hard as they were. I always thought there was other, other things, other tools that could make neighborhoods safer, stronger, more communal. And I just had that inkling as a kid. And as I just began to get older and explore career paths and what made sense, um, you know, the law came my way. I wouldn't say it was a, a linear path, you know, originally I right. was interested in, in natural resources. Um, and I entered the University of Michigan and began studying natural resources and environment. <laughs> and in that, I still, I was always pulled into environmental justice and these policy issues. And I just could, could not um, get away from, from the law, even though at one point I tried. <laughs> I mean, really, but, um, going being an attorney, mm -hmm. though, you can almost major undergrad in anything you want. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah, but I swung um, over to political science. Yeah, yep, yeah, that mm -hmm. would have been a good major. But mm -hmm. a lot of people major in English. They just they do from all justice. They come really from all different types of backgrounds. As that's true. No, that's <laughs> true. Come on, Nancy. Come on, join us. <laughs> well, you know, I do. I actually dated mm -hmm. a guy in mm -hmm. college, and I wrote. He was in law school, and I used to write yeah. his little. Um, what do you do? The pair, the legal um, documents that you had to submit in college. I mm -hmm. was. I, I was what? Like, what? Oh my god! You know, I, I mean, it's kind of like I've already been through at least a few semesters of law school. Already. Oh my goodness! <laughs> come writing come some on, on Nancy. <laughs> you but got I it. Feel, yeah, I already kind of feel like I'm overeducated right now. <laughs> <laughs> Once I pay the student loans I have now. Okay, all know. right. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's flip this around a little bit. So mm -hmm. I know that you're really into tenant advocacy. Now, is there mm -hmm. a moratorium that's going um, away for more people with who are in arrears uh, on their mortgages as well, or is it just for tenants? Well, the... The eviction moratorium is in place for everybody, mm -hmm. but there are still um, there's still FHA guidance to provide mm -hmm. mortgage forbearance relief. So that's not going anywhere, you know. So that's if you good. have an FHA loan or federally insured loan, then you can still talk to your lender. You should talk to your lender, you know, if things mm -hmm. haven't gotten back on track, you know, with this pandemic. Right. It it has been a global pandemic over, you know, for the past year, right? Yeah. So if some remember. people, yeah, some people are not back to work. And if you're having trouble or struggling in that regard, call your lender, you know, and ask for forbearance relief. You know, that's still in place for the federally backed properties, you know, but the eviction moratorium is set to expire on the 30th. Okay. People should know that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so what advice, just to kind of flip this around a little bit, what mm -hmm. advice would you offer real estate investors? Say, you know, we have our event coming up on June 26th, the real mm -hmm. estate investor workshop from 9 a.m. to 12 noon. Um, and I think that every business owner, specifically depending on what type of business that you're mm -hmm. in, have an attorney on retainer. Mm -hmm. So you don't really know what you're going to need them for. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Do arise. I um mm -hmm. I had hired attorney Sobel a couple years back mm -hmm. about an, an employee case that I had with my employer. Mm -hmm. And I never would have thought that, you know, I would have been in a situation where I needed legal services for something like that. Mm -hmm. But um they help negotiate terms. Um they can help lessen fees and penalties. So, mm -hmm. or, you know, eliminate fees and penalties. So mm -hmm. there are definitely perks to having an attorney. Mm -hmm. um, 
Why do you think a real estate investor would need an attorney? What are some of the services that um, attorneys can offer real estate investors? Well, just in, in general, you don't know what you don't know. So Absolutely. You, know, you want to protect yourself. Don't assume you know everything. <laughs> Find a specialist in each category where you're doing business. You want your legal specialist. You want your accounting specialist. You know, if you have employees, you want to make sure you have some HR specialists, you know. No one is a, a master of all. You can have experience Absolutely. in a lot of things, but no one's a specialist in everything. So. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm just saying in general, I don't have any statistics for this, but mm -hmm. um, people who usually um, represent themselves, or I should say people who have legal assistance, they seem to always fare better than people who represent themselves. I guess mm -hmm. there's like a certain level of respect that comes along with having an attorney versus you just saying, well, I'm just going to represent myself. It's like, you're almost just not even heard. So that's so that's true. Cool. Yeah, that's so true. And it's, it comes down to what, you know, I mean, the laws, just like anything they they change, you know, there are updates and there, you just want to make sure that you have someone that's experienced, you know, that's in the arena every day to have your back really. Um, so it's just smart. Just protect yourself. Um, <laughs> protect yeah. your business. Protect yourself from liability. And, and it's not you, you don't have them on the payroll. It's just that mm -hmm. you know someone like, you know, a corporate attorney, if you're mm -hmm. starting an entity or starting a new business, mm -hmm. um, you, there's real estate, um, attorney Sobel, his, he specializes in real estate law. Mm -hmm. Specialize in public policy law, so mm -hmm. you, know, you know people who can't afford services otherwise, they would contact you. So mm -hmm. there's different types of attorneys that specialize in certain types of law. So that's it. They're just mm -hmm. they're part of your team. They're on return. On return yes. And you hire them as needed. It's not like you're, mm -hmm. you know, paying them a paycheck every two months. Right, right. <laughs> Just make sure you have, have them on speed dial. Lock them in your phone. And if you don't know who to call, then ask somebody. Ask a friend for a referral. You know, if you mm -hmm. really, no one can give you a referral, you can call the local bar associations. You can call Detroit Metropolitan Bar Association, Wolverine Bar Association. Right. The State Bar of Michigan has a, a huge <laughs> lawyer referral system for lawyers all over the state. So if you don't know anyone, ask someone. If you don't get any answers there, call the bar associations and make sure you have someone available on your team and i mean i've certainly seen and you can save yourself money it's investing Absolutely. up front yeah, <laughs> it's exactly. investing up front don't let a hundred dollar problem turn into a thousand dollar problem just protect yourself you know absolutely um do you see any current trends in the real estate marketplace um for instance do you see more people needing legal assistance in um, real estate? Yes, I guess it depends on both ends of the spectrum, whether you're a buyer, whether you're a seller, you know, I hope, you know, people are not facing eviction, but as we talked about, some people are, but yeah, you know, the market is, is um, you know, I guess they say it's a seller's market right now, Right. but you know, whether you're a buyer, whether you're a seller, whether you're somewhere in between, you know, you can benefit from having an attorney. Um, so I, I really don't think that advice changes based on the market, really. I don't think it does. I think it's just good, prudent advice um, when you're dealing in real estate or when you're dealing in business, period. You know, it, it's right. all subject to the law. We can't just do what we want to do, how we want to do it. It's all regulated by a law, you know. So you should have a legal professional available to you. Do you think you need an attorney to make major um, financial purchases, such as purchasing a home or renting out commercial space? I mean, how important is that? Mm -hmm. Because I know that you're dealing with legal documents, like your mm -hmm. purchase agreement. Is it really that important to have um, an attorney review those documents, or do you think because it's already been vetted, mm -hmm. that it's not necessary? No, you should understand what you sign. You know, if you ever get in a dispute about anything, the contract will govern, the lease will govern, the purchase agreement will govern. If it's not in that document, I won't say you don't have a chance. It just mm -hmm. gets 
it just gets a lot more difficult if you don't have an attorney. I could say that, or if you don't have it in writing. Some people say, um, if it's not in writing, it doesn't exist. I won't go that far. <laughs> but if it's not in writing, it is extremely difficult to prove it exists. Mm -hmm. So you want to understand what you sign. You know, it may look, um, you know, pretty straightforward. And just look at it like you're you're asking someone to do a document review. So you may not need full blown legal representation. Exactly. You may just need a document review because there could be something in that one little paragraph that you need to change two or three little words <laughs> to protect yourself. And it's just good to have a second set of eyes on things. Um, and sometimes, you know, we've also heard the phrase, you know, um, ignorance of the law is not not an excuse. Um, and I've seen some very well uh, intentioned people get taken advantage of because they didn't know what they didn't know, you know. So it, it doesn't hurt, you know, if you're a, a very successful business owner, you know, not low to moderate income, get an attorney or retainer. If you're mo moving up the income scale, right? And um, you just need, you can't quite afford someone at the moment, contact legal services <laughs> um, mm -hmm. or the bar associations to try and get pro bono assistance. But the contract is everything, you know, almost everything, you should say. And I've seen, you know, people say, but I said, and we discussed, and they said they'd add it in there, but it didn't make it in. Right. You know, the writing is what governs, and you have to be really, really careful with those um, oral agreements and those side conversations to make sure it's in the document and what you intended to happen is reflected that way in the document. What, um, you hear this too, that people say, well, I signed it, but I didn't know what I was signing. How valid mm -hmm. is that gonna hold up in court? Well, it's like the I said, it's, beware. it is very buyer's beware, I won't say, it's impossible, but it's a lot more difficult. You have to prove fraud. You have to prove misrepresentation. I just did. I just didn't read it. It's, it's not. Typically, it's not good enough. Yeah. Typically, it's not good enough. You have to prove that someone intended to take advantage of you. Um, yeah, bait and switch. Mm -hmm. So it can be done, but those are very, very high standards to meet. So. You can save yourself a lot of time and a lot of headache. <laughs> exactly. I'm all for defending the, the little person, certainly. And I've seen people get taken advantage of in some horrible things. But that being said, you know, if you can take an additional time, take the additional time, let someone look over that agreement for you, give it a second glance, get a legal opinion, you know, it's well worth it. I agree. I mean, if nothing else for peace of mind, if nothing mm -hmm. else, it can be <laughs> sleep at night. Exactly. Oh, I mean, I trust to have an attorney and you want to make sure even the attorneys, yes. that, unfortunately, it's good attorneys and bad attorneys. Mm -hmm. I had somebody yes. look at it who I trust. You know, mm -hmm. I know that they're well known in the community. They have, they're have they very reputable. They have a great reputation. Mm -hmm. And if they said it's okay, I can. I feel a lot better about signing this. Mm -hmm. What I'm mm -hmm. hearing from you is it's just it's better to be proactive versus reactive. It is much better, mm -hmm. much better. Let's protect yeah. yourself, you know. Um, super say I can go to court. You can, you know, well, but it might be <laughs> everything else. Yeah, you know, it's but it can take a couple of years off your life. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, so you had said like an attorney, um, look over or them reviewing some documents, a document mm -hmm. review, that's the term you use. Right. Mm -hmm. um, like what kind of, how much does that cost? Because I actually, um, mm -hmm. I have a form that I'll be filling, filing over the summer, um, you know, the Articles of Incorporation for mm -hmm. our nonprofit. So we're a membership organization right now, but I'm going to place, uh, um, apply for, 501c3 exemption mm -hmm. for the university or institute now, DBHG Institute. Okay. So how much do you think this overview would cost for them to look over our articles of incorporation? Well, 
I'll tell you. Starting <laughs> race, anything like that. I just want to get a ballpark so I kind of know what to expect. Geez, well, attorneys are all over the place. Just yeah, like, <laughs> they're all over the place. You have some that will do it for, you know, you can eyeball it and they'll do it. It's a flat fee, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Even with a flat fee, attorneys typically think of things in hour increments. Mm -hmm. So if you ask what what's your billable hour, I mean, most attorneys who've been out, you know, for a while, I would just say, you know, $150 an hour is on the lower end of things. Um, so you could have an attorney that would say it's by the hour, you put down a retainer to kind of figure out how much they believe it'll cost to ask you for a retainer and they'll deduct from the time. And if you have anything left, you'll get it back. Some attorneys would do it that <laughs> way. Whoever gets their money back. Oh, so attorneys are kind of so bad. I was like, can I please get a refund for my like, They're going to be please. pretty accurate in their uh -huh. estimate. But <laughs> like, actually, you went over your billable mm -hmm. hours. So you actually owe me the Oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> yeah, everything. <counts. laughs> like, Thank everything. You for the services. Phone calls, sharpening the pencil. <laughs> it's all in there. Okay. <laughs> I'll sharpen a pencil. I know, but like, they're going to drag their retainer out as much as they can. Like, Why are you saying, actually give the money back or some of the money back. Hey, saying that's that's the that's the business <laughs> model. I'll just call you wish you a happy birthday. And like, okay, that took like that do, was do, about do, 15 do. minutes. <laughs> send you a happy birthday e-card and then see you in, a yes. and deduct that off your retainer. In increments. Usually in increments within the hour. And you round up. So <laughs> that's, the, that's the side of the profession where we get our reputation from as attorneys. Yeah, exactly. But I'll give you some other information too to round it out. <laughs> we just have to keep it real, right? Some, a lot right. of attorneys are going to charge you by the hour. That is what the profession yeah. does. But you have some who try to contain costs and they'll estimate the time in their head and <laughs> give you a <laughs> I'm telling you where this comes from, but they'll give you a flat fee and they'll stick to it for better or worse. If it takes longer, then they lose. If it takes shorter, then you know they win. But they'll give you a flat fee so you're not wondering what's happening, right? Now here's the good news for nonprofits. <laughs> that are, <laughs> I'll give you one resource to check out. Um, okay. Michigan Community Resources. Um, okay. They are a nonprofit based in the city of Detroit and they provide transactional assistance, pro bono assistance to nonprofit organizations. So there is kind of a matching, an application process. Um, they can only pair people with as many pro bono attorneys that they have, but they do work with, you know, a lot of the big firms in town, you know, there's um, an expectation, like me, I work with nonprofit organizations all the time, right? <laughs> but I work for nonprofit organizations, you know, but for attorneys that do not, there is an expectation um, as a member of the bar that you complete a certain amount of pro bono service every year you know it's okay. not a penalty if you don't but it's a high expectation it's part of the our o for whatnot um mm -hmm. so michigan community resources connects with um non attorneys that typically don't do nonprofit work um and they match them with nonprofits to work on very specific projects and it's not a there's not a fee for the nonprofit because the attorneys are doing it as part of their pro bono service commitment. So there you go. So for nonprofits, um, particularly um, Detroit area based nonprofits, check out Michigan Community Resources. It is an application, you have to fill it out. <laughs> but do that and try and get matched up with a pro bono attorney. Um, and it's for a discrete project also, be mindful of that so you don't keep them on re a long time, okay, but if yeah. you have so like for one, one, this is a, a one yeah. hit and done thing. <laughs> <laughs> so or it might be a couple, but they're not on retainer. <laughs> to, <you know. laughs> but it can save you, it's a good a good organization and a, a great mission to connect nonprofits with attorneys as well. So check out Michigan right. Community Resources. I, will, I made a note mm -hmm. and I put it in our comment section as well. Mm -hmm. Well, Tanya, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, I know that you're currently not taking clients, which I guess mm -hmm. is a good thing, but I appreciate <laughs> the referral. 
So I will definitely look into that for the summer. Okay. Um, any closing comments? And we do hope you join us on the 26th because we are, right now we don't have, uh, we're going to have a panel discussion at the end of the event mm -hmm. towards the end. And we don't have an attorney um, as part of our panel now, if you would like to join us for that. So you can let me know offline. Okay. Um, any right. closing remarks that you have for our audience today? Sure. This has just been such a fun conversation. Yeah, so really fun. thank you it's for nice to having up me. With you too. We'll have to catch oh. up there sometime. Yes. <laughs> I just say knowledge is power. You know, no matter what, where you are, what you're working on, just make sure that you're informed. Knowledge is power, and just work, work in integrity. You know, work in integrity. Yeah. Um, treat others. The golden rule. You yeah. know, treat yeah. others how you would like to be treated. You know and do business do business and excellence so those are my i guess my my parting words to, <laughs> to everyone so well thank you so much i was so impressed when i got your bio i'm like i can't believe all the stuff that you've done in such a short amount of time and uh -huh. congratulations on all of your accolades i'm glad that your family's doing well and i'm um, like i said we will be in touch hopefully we'll see you all on right six thanks everybody thank Bye. you hey, everybody have a great Bye. afternoon and evening We'll see you on Thursday at 6 p.m. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us this evening. We look forward to seeing you this Thursday at 6 p.m. for part two with Attorney Phillips. Hopefully, we can kind of dig in more to this renter's moratorium and offer options to people who are looking for that. And we look so forward to you joining us again on Thursday at 6. Everyone have a great evening. Bye-bye.